It's a first panel session for the year 2023, and we're going to be talking about the business outlook for the year. We've got the perfect panel to make that happen. I'm going to have them introduce themselves, starting with Matt. Happy New Year to you. Uh, Matt Hammond, I'm the senior partner and leader for PwC across the West Midlands uh, and the Midlands overall, and the chair of West Midlands Growth Company. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Hi guys, um, I'm Celinda Pendress, I'm co-founder of the Love Writing Company. So we've got a range of innovative writing products for kids. It's all about getting kids away from the frustration of writing, making it fun and easier so they learn to love writing. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us, Celinda. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Conrad Brunson from Tonic Talent. We're a hospitality and catering recruitment company and I also head up a, a networking uh, event here in Birmingham for the industry as well. Welcome. Morning, I'm Roman Crozier, a Chief Executive at Seabrand Hour & Co Limited. We're a tool making and stamping company employing 70 people, turning over close to 10 million, based in Newtown in Birmingham. So we've got a fair breadth of industries and skills covered here, haven't we today? I guess the first question that I want to throw out, in the headlines pretty much ever since we started the new year is, what's the government going to do to help the economy? Is the government doing enough to help companies with energy bills, with solving the strike situation? So I just maybe want to throw this one out to the panel to start with and say, if you've got a wish list, is there something you think the government should be doing at the moment or could be doing at the moment to help? I mean, Matt, from your point of view, you, you, you come across a broad range of sectors. You know, what are, you, what are people telling you and what do you think about that? Look, if, there, if there's one watchword that I'd, that I'd have, and it, it, this isn't really just about government, it goes to businesses, it goes to the consumer, it goes to, to overseas investors in the UK, it would be about stability and confidence, secondly. Um, you know, as soon as stability goes, confidence starts to go. As soon as confidence goes, business decisions get, get delayed or procrastinated over quite, quite understandably. And I think for most I think for most people leading businesses, whether they're SMEs or international businesses or otherwise, the reality is that they've gone now through pretty much 14 years of almost a situation of perma crisis, right? We went through the global financial crisis. Mm. Most of the last sort of decade in the UK has been dominated by a discussion around Brexit and the impact of that. Um, we then got the pandemic. So leaders at all sorts of levels need some stability. And if we're, continue, if we're going to continue to make the UK attractive as a place to invest in, to work in, uh, for consumers to spend their money in, then we need some stability. Which Digby Jones was saying a bit earlier on in the show about how what we need is a little bit of a, a boring time. Mm. You know, we've had so many, it's been an absolute roller coaster, hasn't it, over the last few months? Nobody quite knows, is it good times around the corner? Is it bad times? Have we seen the worst of it? Is inflation at the highest it's going to be? Is it going to get worse? Mm. How far ahead do you look at the moment? Can you look? I, th I think it's difficult to look much further ahead than this year <laughs> um, in reality. You know, most businesses will plan over a five-year cycle, but the further you go out from year one to year five, as we all experience, I'm sure, um, it's, it's more difficult to get accurate. And, and the reality is, if you tried to plan for 2023 five years ago, <laughs> you'd have to tear that up, OK? Absolutely. Uh, so being really dynamic about business planning and business decisions is critical. And I, I look at... A lot of our clients led by, by individuals, a lot of the people that work with them, a lot of colleagues. We're each used to taking decisions in a much more agile way over the course of what the last three years has thrown at us in particular. So I think we should all have some confidence that actually we've been through some tough stuff already. We've had, as I just said, 12 or 14 years of tough stuff. It would be quite nice actually just, I'll tell you what would be really nice is to have the summer that we had last summer in Birmingham. Right. Can't, we can't do the good <laughs> games again. I know, I know. <laughs> can't can't games games but, but just to have that period of focus on something that was good mm -hmm. um, and positive and inclusive uh, in a way that brought everybody together would be really helpful. It's quite interesting. Uh, would that be the same expectation that you have, Salander, as a small business owner? What is, what is the outlook for you? What are you looking at, for, uh, particularly from the government? Uh, what do you think the year should hold? Yeah, I think um, as, a, as an SME, we only set up three years ago, so we've probably been through the worst turbulent time you could possibly get. For me, I think um, the government needs to give a little bit of reassurance that they are there. Um, I've seen very little sort of reassurance, sort of policy, sort of help, support for small SMEs. And obviously it's a very worrying time. So um, if con obviously all consumers are worried about the energy, they're worried about the cost of living. Um, but if they don't have the finance, they can't 
buy from me they can't purchase from me so it's it's more worrying than ever and um i've seen very little reassurance from the government i'd like to see a bit more like we're here to help you we're going to put some policies together we're going to put some plans together um being an entrepreneur especially an sme it's quite lonely and when you've got no lap when you've got no support um, you know, we've got some support groups and some business groups. And what I'd like to see is possibly them looking at how can we reach out to the small SMEs who really are our economy. We need SMEs uh, for our economy. So I'd like to have some reassurance, obviously some confidence um, as well. And maybe it doesn't have to be all about financial support. It can be a little bit about like, you know, here's a support group here. Here's like some, you know, what do you need help with marketing? What do you need help with funding? What do you need help with investment? What do you need? just some maybe some pathways i mean the government were talking last week prime minister wasn't he about um, the importance of literacy and numeracy and boosting that i guess from your business's point of view that was quite good to hear yeah it? that was brilliant like to hear and there's been quite a f quite a bit of noise um uh, in in sort of like you know the news about how children need more help and support so for me it's brilliant i've got i've got resources that can meet that need but the channel to, to, to get there is probably a little bit hazy. It's like, how do I get there? How do I reach these people? I've got products that can help. I've got resources. I've got, I've got, I've got what they're looking for, but how's the path? How do I actually get there? Who do I reach to? And I've tried many times to reach people, um, you know, in, in, in the sort of like the government sector. It's very difficult. Um, but yeah, it is good news and I'm glad to see there's more in education. I'm glad to see there's more of a focus on childcare. I'm glad to see there's more focus on children's well-being as well as their education as well. But then the pathways to participation, yeah. like you rightly said, and I'm sure that that's going to be the same for quite a number of other industries because like yeah. you rightly said, you know, the small businesses are the bedrock of the economy. And Conrad, what's been your experience in this uh, time that we had last year, all the ups and downs and coming to the new year? Uh, particularly your sector, the hospitality industry yeah. is, is a massive <laughs> one in the country. Yeah, it's been a very, everyone knows, it's been a very difficult year. Uh, you know, uh, the hospitality sector has started to recover. Uh, yesterday, there were some numbers released from some of the big players that they'd actually started to make a profit at the end of last year, which hopefully that's filtering down to independence as well. People I've spoken to, even just the start of this year, have actually been quite buoyed by the number of people that have been coming through the doors. So the conversations we've been having with clients and connections, people have been nicely surprised with the numbers that they're getting. So hopefully that can continues throughout the year. I think the, the support from the government with regards to the energy crisis, that doesn't, I don't need to go into that. Something's going to need to continue there um, because, you know, it, I spoke to one client, a large hotel, their energy cost used to be £500 per day. It's £5,500 per day. It went up to one stage. So you just cannot pass that on to the consumer. So something's going to have to happen there. Um, a reduction in VAT um, is something that a lot of our clients and connections are saying that that would be fantastic to That's see. That's been suggested a few times, hasn't it? It has, yeah, the yeah for budgets, the industry. Then it didn't happen, well, it's something that was you know, happened during the pandemic and, you know, it, it did help. Um, and I think if something was to happen with a, a freer movement of labour back in as well, because a lot of people are struggling to find the right kind of people uh, to, to come and fulfil the demand. You know, we hear about some people who've got uh, say a hotel and they can't sell the whole hotel simply because they haven't got the chambermaid to make the beds. Now that that's really, really poor and we need to address that, you know, because the demand's there. Uh, so there are, there are different ways the government can help. I appreciate it's not a bottomless pit. Uh, and there are a lot of people calling out for that help, but certainly hospitality's had a right kick in over the last three years since the pandemic. I don't think anyone's been affected uh, worse. So yeah, hopefully the, the recovery will continue and we'll see the support continue as well. How, how worried are you in terms of the lifestyle changes that people are having with their working lives at the moment in that people are working from home or maybe they're not in town in the city on a Friday, which is a mm -hmm. busy day for the hospitality sector. Are those trends just here to stay regardless of the economy now? Yeah, I think forward thinking operators are going to have to think how that they can, you know, adjust their businesses. Maybe you, you look at doing something for, for takeaway. I don't know. There are a number of ways that you could look at doing that. And we, we actually spoke before we came on air, didn't we, about adjusting opening times. And that might be something that people look to do in order that actually their, their labour budget is therefore reduced. They're not using the energy costs that they would if they maybe do have to close a day. It's frustrating to see closed businesses, but at the end of the day, I'd rather see that business still be, be trading on the days that there's demand there for it, really. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's just about being a, a you know, clever operator uh, and, and running your business accordingly, really. And what about with your manufacturing hat on then, Ro? How, how are you feeling in terms of support that's available or, or not? Um, I can sort of 
um, understand what these guys are saying and support that. We're, we're very similar. So if I start with the positives, so from a skills and R&D perspective, apprenticeships have been life-changing for our business. If you invest in it over the medium to long term, you get the return from it. You've got to see that as a long-term fix, really, uh, to, to developing your engineers of the future. Secondly, R&D. Again, over the pandemic, we managed to retain an awful lot of expensive employees by plunging them into collaborative R&D projects, which are funded, government funded by Innovate UK. That was fabulous for us. And that got us into new markets, new industries, um, and helped us to retain some of those skills that we'd spent so much time developing and securing. Um, they're the positives. That must continue and businesses must continue to benefit from that in, from an engineering and skills perspective. The negatives, I think people have touched on from, from I can talk as an SME engineering company, um, there is a distinct lack of business support um, for small, small sort of um, uh, strategic projects, whether that be a, a, a small piece of equipment you want to buy and try out, a low risk way, whether that be some consultancy that you want to secure for strategic marketing, there's a lack of that and it's getting less and less and less. It's shrunk since European funding is now beginning to dry up. What's the alternative? How can we drive that confidence back into SMEs to invest in sort of taking those risks again? Um, and the other one which has been touched on is energy. So our energy bill in one year has gone from £110,000 a year to half a million pounds a year. We're not a heavy user. We're not a heavy user. Um, and that's with business support. And I think the announcements yesterday, I'm yet to sort of unravel that, but I, I, I think um, we probably are going to lose that, tape it off over the next sort of six months or so. Um, that is not going to work for any business really. You can pass it on in manufacturing, a proportion of it, but that's not sustainable. We become uncompetitive with other European countries that haven't seen the same increases as we have. And I mean, Matt, from your point of view, do you think there's quite a lot of companies as a result of that kind of issue that are going to see their profits dented this year because they don't want to pass price increases on to their customers for fear of losing trade and so they're having to soak up a lot of this themselves? Yeah, it's, it's really painful, isn't it, Visceral, when you hear the examples that, that have just been talked about. And, and whether you're a heavy or a light user, you know, a 500% a increase is a 500% increase. Uh, and I think it's, it's near on impossible for businesses to pass that directly on, which means that ultimately other choices then have to be made. So being, as was just referred to, you know, smart with other business decisions, that might be around staffing, it may be around opening hours, um, it may be around the projects you do pursue, um, and looking looking really smartly for other other advice and support that, it, that is out there. It's just difficult to find, isn't it? Sometimes, you know, if you're, if you're on your own running an SME, um, then would you know to pick up the phone to the Chambers of Commerce or the DIT or the growth company who can help with a variety of the different aspects of how businesses can continue to succeed and explore different markets, but it's tough stuff. Mm. And actually the energy crisis so far, um, you know, we've seen the start of it. We're, mm. we're not at the end of it. And so the readjustment that is taking place, and you've seen various different, I mean, over the, over the period of December, we've seen um, office operators nationally and globally, you know, turn their offices down by a degree or two. Mm close laws, etc. at certain times, certain certain days of the week. So everybody's having to think quite differently in a way that actually you wouldn't have imagined five years ago. You just wouldn't have imagined doing it five years ago or even three years ago. Um, but unless you do that, then the consequences are, are so acute, mm. um, then you're almost forced into it. It's, it's survival, isn't it? Really, it's survival at that I point. guess there's also an issue, and maybe from the hospitality industry's <laughs> point of view more so than others, that a lot of, a lot of businesses used up a lot of their reserves over the last couple of years with COVID and a lot of things, they've buffered their sort of rainy day funds and now those coffers are empty, aren't they? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, I can't think of anyone who's had a bumper time in our industry really over the last three years. It was survival. You know, even people who very quickly adjusted their business to maybe do takeaway boxes. I can think of some businesses that thrived. I mean, very locally to here, you've got uh, Actar Islamo theme. He's got a Michelin star restaurant, you know, fabulous restaurant, and he started doing takeaway boxes. It, actually, from that, a, a new business has spawned. He employs ten people. He's got new units. So, 
But I, I wouldn't think that he's probably anywhere near he was kind of pre-pandemic, you know. Um, it's probably taken a little bit of time for that business to start to make the other, keep the other one afloat effectively. So, yeah, I don't think anyone's got uh, big reserve funds. We, we need a good time really this year. Um, and, and again, before we came on air, we were talking about sort of using businesses, you know, uh, use it or lose it. And I think we, we should try to be, uh, you know, put money back into the local economy by going to independent restaurant, independent coffee shop rather than some of the larger brands. Uh, I think that's really important and that has a big effect. Absolutely. And, and and I think the overarching theme has been the fact that as business leaders, there's so much more that we have to jostle with now uh, that we have to think about. We talked about the energy crisis. Skills shortage is another big one, you know, uh, and I'm sure that you, you all must have experienced it in your business to one degree or the other. You spoke about apprenticeship earlier. And uh, the question becomes, you know, uh, both from a large business perspective and even from small business perspective. Uh, and I know that you do, Conrad, a lot of work in the skills uh, space, particularly for your industry as well uh, what are you seeing in that dimension is that in adding to the increased costs that businesses are having to deal with in terms of competing for talent and things of that nature but generally speaking in that area uh, what's been what's been the trend mm, absolutely I mean salaries within hospitality have probably increased I'd say overall about 20% so again the operator that has to be passed on directly to them and, and therefore maybe to us down as the consumer as well they're starting to level out a little bit more now but still there's not enough supply you know to fulfill there's more vacancies within hospitality might, people might think is a good thing for us but it's certainly not what I want even as a recruiter um, you know Brexit was we all know the effect that that had on many many industries but actually the pandemic on the back of that meant that sort of a lot of people left and just just did not come back you know they left the industry i think if we just had brexit a lot of people who worked within hospitality in this industry in this country would never have had that opportunity to maybe rethink what they were doing if you were a, a chef or someone working in let's you know, look at a larger brand not not somewhere where, where it's all fresh food and it, it, it's all you're there for the passion but somewhere where it just did become a job to you if amazon are offering you 20 quid an hour to go and be a delivery driver working nine to five and paid overtime a lot of people are going to take that a lot of people stayed in the industry of course but that's because it's their passion but there are a lot of people that we lost um so yeah i mean a freer movement of labor we know it'd help the nhs but it'd certainly help our industry uh, as well within hospitality and catering and and what's been your experience in that regard uh Salander? um for me so uh, being a small sme it's always um, until we get the investment in until we get the like the business up and running it's always like hard to find talent um and especially so i i was lucky i actually did get some apprentices as well and i've got to say they've been phenomenal for me so they i've been able to like train them i've been able to help and support them put something back into the economy as well by supporting like local like labor so um we're at a stage where we now are growing and we are looking um to expand and we want to we want we want to find you know local skills but it can be difficult in the sector that we're in as well so um i've i like i said i've used the apprentice i've been part of the um apprenticeships and i've got to say it's a phenomenal scheme it's brilliant for helping the young people we're all about supporting young people children upwards and part of that is you know uh, supporting teenagers young people in giving them some skills so we did use the kickstarter scheme when that came in and I thought it was phenomenal. So from that we had two and uh, we've retained one of them. So I've been able to um, keep the skill set and also put something back into the economy by enabling them to employ them afterwards yeah, so as well. So that was a brilliant scheme and I just wish the government would do a bit more like that as Because well. it's unusual, isn't it? You know, in, in, traditionally in times of recession, you don't have such a tight labour market, do you? You normally have you know, a big pool of workers who are out there desperate for jobs but what we're hearing is that some employers they're just they're, they're offering interviews to people and then they're, people are just not turning up or oh, gosh, they want yeah. to put a counter offer into an employer say yeah I'll mm -hmm. come and work for you but I want more than you're offering and I want to work from home and I want private head medical care and I want a company Porsche and you know, it's, 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 it, it, the boots on the other foot somehow isn't it do you do you think Matt, at the moment? Uh, it, it has been it still is I, I think there are some signs of that changing a little bit um, that if, if you looked at the dimensions around this, there's, there's, there's recruitment and retention. I think retention's become really, really important as well. Um, and there are lots of um, places you can look for in terms of you know, inspiration around retention and what that really looks like, depending on the industries. Um, 
but then it also is boiling down to recognition and reward. Now, there's been, there has been a massive change, right? The, the pandemic itself brought around a massive change, not just in working habits. There was that, was it the 23rd of March? Um, <coughs> that everybody essentially was working from home that year, three years ago. Uh, you know, there was one big swing lever to change almost everybody's habits that needed to happen. That, there is no swing lever to come back the other way. So we've got the benefits of some of that flexibility and mobility, and I have absolutely no doubt that there are some jobs, some vocations that actually are maybe better done, or at least better done in hybrid in that way. But for many of the experiences we've just talked about, actually there are far deeper impacts of, of working together, physically being co-located that, that have other benefits as well. I mean, like for one, clearly the hospitality industry um, <clears throat> would be far better supported if, if, if we were where we were three years ago. But the reality is it's probably not coming back in quite that way in that pattern. So <clears throat> I, I, I'll go back to where I started really. You know, We've talked a little bit about government spending, but if you looked at the UK economy, there are sort of three elements to it. There's government spending, there's consumer spending, and there's business investment. And consumer spending patterns have also changed markedly. You know, where people spend their time, how they spend their money, what they don't spend their money on equally. And so consumer decisions are going to have an enormous impact, regardless of their own negotiations with employers and everything we see going on right now. A huge impact on the very industries that, that you see around this table. And at PwC, we're only a reflection of our clients. So, um, you know, yes, we're a sector in our own right and a very successful one and a very big one in this part of the world. Um, but ultimately, it's consumer spending and business investment that needs to follow any government decisions. And unless you've got the three, you've got weaknesses inherent in the economy. And I mean, Rowan, from your point of view, you know, it was all very well, wasn't it? When, when the pandemic kicked in, people say, right, work from home. You know, if you're a tool maker, no, you, you can't people in you can't do that, can <laughs> you? So, so, so how much did, how many, you weren't able to change to the degree that the government maybe wanted you to, I suppose. No, uh, we were manufacturing components for medical face masks. So we actually became, we got key worker status pretty quickly and the factory remained open pretty much right through. Um, roughly speaking, um, we reduced our headcount down from uh, approximately 60 people down to about 40. We had 20 in the factory and 20 working from home, pretty much. That's how we, we worked it. Um, and we were like that pretty much for about a year. Um, business then came back and, and off it came. Um, but we, 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 are, we did see some of, the, some of the, the same sort of challenges there, getting people, well, people who were in the factory said, well, well that's not fair. Initially, that's not fair. We, We'd like to work from home as well, and it's like, well, you can't. Your job just doesn't allow it. Um, and then when we actually came to bring people back to work, that's been not too bad. But again, we have seen some people raise questions and say, well, actually, I'd rather work from home. And it's, it's getting that balance right. There is always a compromise, and we still do work in, in a hybrid situation, and there is better flexibility to allow that to happen. And we've sort of embedded that informally in our policies to allow it to carry on. Um, but people are doing things differently just just in that working environment in our factory and that sort of spills out into everything else how long they want to work for how much they want to earn while they're working um how much they want to spend how they want to spend it do they want it delivered to their door do they want to go out and get all of those things is is a massive reboot and reset um and i hate to use the sort of the the terminology the new normal but that's what we called it and that's it and i think we're still settling in which doesn't help with the certainty point that we all said we, we need going into this year I, think, I do think there are a number of features that we've seen as well right so we've seen vast numbers of people leave the workforce over the last three years um i i, I think what will happen there is that a lot of those people and you know there is the, the sort of 50 plus category that left as a as a as a mass exodus almost i think a number of those people will have done calculations based on the previous 10 years of low interest rates low inflation relatively stable prices etc I, th I think we'll see an influx back to come back next back, yeah, in, the the old old back into the workforce and let's be really clear when we're talking about skills you know that also talks about experience and bringing some of that experience back will be really helpful We've talked about um, uh, migration flows, essentially, of, of, of workforce as well, because that is a key part of what we need, need in the UK. There are other skills that have been developed over the course of the last three years. 
if you'd have asked us all back in early March three years ago, could you all work from home tomorrow? We'd all have, we'd all have gone, mm, not sure we could actually. We think the technology's there, but we, we're not really sure. Mm. And most businesses went through that. So people have, have learnt new skills, and in particular, as we employ quite a lot of young people, um, new joiners to the workforce, of course, have readily adapted to that straight away. At the same time, we've probably lost some of the skills that, that are also important for, for a holistically successful business model. And you lost that quite abruptly, don't you? Well, you, lo you and you lose skills. it through the, you know, people being, there are things that happen when people are co-located yep. that don't happen on a Microsoft Absolutely. Teams call or a Google Meet or a Zoom call or whatever, right? There are things that, that are much better done mm. together. And we know also that it's probably not very healthy for most people to work at home the entire time. Exactly. Right? You know, we're sat in your, in your place here, we're on the right type of chairs, at the right type of desk height, with the right type, you know, you've got the right kit. It is not healthy for people to be working alone long term on the, on the end of their kitchen pedestal or wherever they, they may be. And it's definitely not healthy for some of the businesses that, that, that we've talked about. So again, it comes down to using the skills that we've acquired over the last three years and also look in how we can reintegrate other new skills that are going to need to be developed to create a more successful economy. And there are two areas on that in particular. And again, kids and young people pick this up really quickly. Technology skills, right? So it's become assumed now in most, in most of our environments. Every industry will have its own software and hardware differences. But technology skills, absolutely critical. So digital skills and reaching some of our... Some of our disadvantaged communities, particularly in this city, where actually they don't have, and people don't have ready access to what we probably will take for granted. I bet if you'd ask the panel, everybody's got a laptop and a mobile phone and a prob a probably an bunch iPad. Here, then. Are we yeah, we're we're so, but that, that doesn't exist everywhere. So we can't take that, let's not take that for granted because we've got to release the potential of that part of the working population that will come through to fulfill some of the, the requirements. And then the whole environment that we haven't touched on, of course, is, is, is carbon reduction, uh, net zero emissions. And actually, there are a whole range of new industries and jobs being created there, as well as skills for the future. But there are also things that, that maybe employees who are looking for jobs now are far more focused on when it comes to choosing an employer to work for. I mean, yeah, the salary is important, but they, yeah. what, what, yeah. what the next generation are looking for, questions they want answering are very different, are they? Yeah. 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 But for me as well, I have found um, with the hybrid working and also it's opened up a new world for me. I've been able to connect to people. Normally you'd, you'd have to you know, drive in, get a bus, get a train, whatever, and get in and you've wasted an hour, wasted your... Suddenly you can go on a Zoom call. I could be talking to anybody. It doesn't matter. I've, I've had like calls um, from, it could be someone from Australia, it could be America, it could be London, it could be Manchester. There isn't that, whereas before, oh, I've got to go to that meeting, I've got to get there, it's going to take me half a day. It like takes one minute now, switch on the laptop. So what I have found, it's opened my business up to work with other people um, and other sectors and industries and countries, which I wouldn't normally think about. And it's become normal now to just jump on a Zoom or Microsoft or Google Meets call, okay. and it doesn't matter where where it is. So, um, I, <coughs> I I I did. Um, there's a great call, a great scheme called We Are Change, where they um, connect sort of um, talent and industries, and they help small businesses. I had five people I worked with. One was in Kenya. One was in Australia. One was in. I would never dream of having that before. So the hybrid working and the working from home, it does work and it can actually help as it's well. Quite, it's quite interesting because, I mean, if it takes some of the subject matters that we've talked about, whether it be, you know, where talent is coming from or the high turnover of employees, this also places a lot of responsibility on the businesses and possibly cost as well in terms of training of the staff and of the people. And whether it be apprentices or even regular employees that you're hiring and things of that nature, what has that trend been like? Have you seen a rise in training costs? Because I know you do a bit of recruitment, Conrad. Yeah, I think that um, one of the biggest things that we've seen in hospitality is, is much improved working practices on the operator side. So it's become, it used to be the rigour that someone could work, you know, 60, 70 plus hours a week. 
um, always working weekends. I think that there's a lot of change gone into making it a more positive industry to work in. And I think that the people who are um, who are not coming on board with that are going to uh, have fallen behind and will continue to fall behind. Um, I think training has always been something that people have, uh, good employers have invested in within hospitality. I don't really see as that's changed too much. I think that people, we spoke about the retention piece, people who are being developed within their roles, again, whether you're working in a coffee shop or a Michelin star restaurant or a hotel, if you're continually being developed and learning new skills, you will stay around. Actually, it's proven that you will stay around more so for that than actually a couple of grand in your salary, depending on where your starting point is. So I think that that's vitally important. But actually, I do think that uh, the successful operators are, are becoming better at retaining their people by improved practices. And that can only be a positive thing for our industry, definitely. Which I think it brings, brings on to another broad point isn't it, that we were keen to talk about today, which is the mindset of the business leader. You know, how much... As, as, the, as a company owner, has a boss actually got to alter their expectations, their aspirations, their working practices, their management styles over, you know, because of all of this we've talked about so far? Very much, well, like I said, we've had to very much look at the well-being, and we've, we, we're all about supporting, um, you know, we, we, ask, we ask our staff, you know, we want to check that they're okay. We regularly check in with them. We regularly say, what do you want to do? Do you want to work from home? We give them the options. We're flexible. We're, you know, a few days in, a few days out. But the mindset piece, um, some of our staff have really sort of had to have the extra help and support. I've had, whether I've gone externally to get them some support. Um, so for me, myself, like I've had to be more resilient than ever. I've had to change. Um, I've, al I've always been a person that's quite, uh, you know, I can sense and I can talk to people. Um, but I've had to really sort of, you know, step back a little bit and think, um, what can I do more? I've had to strengthen my own mindset, my own well-being. I've had to like look after myself more as well, just so I can be there for that person in front of me as well. So, um, and I think it's very important that leaders do look after themselves and do, um, you know, very much look after their well-being and mindset because, you know, if we fall apart, the business is not going to function <laughs> without us. Business. There is no business. So, um, yeah, I've um, very much adapted to be a little... I've always been an open person and, you know, very approachable. I think most people find me quite approachable. But then, like, with the staff, I've had to, like, just get that balance to say, yeah, I'm here for you. Um, let me know what you need. Um, how can I help you? How can I support you? And I think just saying things like that and being a bit more open has made them more feel that, yes, there is someone here who's looking after us. And they've had, and with COVID as well, it's not just been issues at work they've had lots of they're facing a lot of emotion and issues at home like you said working from home some people have just um you know it's really they've suffered their mindsets really like suffered their well-being's like really suffered so um you know it's just having that balance understanding what's going on in their personal life as well and that's trying nice. to get that balance yeah i think we've we seen we've mental health obviously has shot up the agenda yeah. hasn't it in the last couple Absolutely. of years because there's an acceptance that adapting to what we've had to adapt to is far easier for some people's family circumstances than it is for yeah. others if you happen to have a spare office at home and you haven't got two then kids the children are affected as well exactly yeah. it's the and whole then, balance of it yeah we've had to face it where we've we've had to like create packs for, for well-being for mindset for children because the parents have come to us we're very very community-led and we do a lot of free resources we do a lot of help and support for so we're not just like a physical resources company we, we're very much a community and we help um, as well so the amount of parents that have come to us and said my child needs help what can I do how can you support me can you can you do something um, so it's it's crazy the amount of parents that need the support but now the children the, 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 the effects are just beginning to come in now because they haven't mixed for a long time they haven't been to school for a long time they haven't especially the younger younger children the age two and three who've had no socializing for a long time so yeah we have to think about the parents and then like because then that affects the children as well have you rowan in the manufacturing sector had to become a different kind of boss do you think as a result of what's happened i'd like to think i've been reasonably consistent and there's two pieces of advice that i always give people one is spot the opportunity and everything it's an entrepreneurial sort of spark and i try and employ people on that basis as well that we're bringing into the business no matter how negative, whatever's happening, you've got to deal with it. But there, there's invariably, there is an opportunity on the other side of that. Um, and, and it's trying to 
be best placed or steer the group or get advice from somebody that can help you spot that and hopefully grasp it. Um, and the second thing, when I first took on running Brand Hour, I wanted to change everything overnight. Um, and I, you know, that ambition I think is, is important, but as you become more experienced, more seasoned, and what the world has thrown at us as business uh, leaders uh, in the last sort of 10 years and, and more, it takes time to drive change and, and good, constructive, positive, consistent change. It takes time. So lower your expectations down a touch, be a bit more realistic and pick the things, particularly for an SMA, that make the biggest impact and go for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Matt, particularly in your in your business, dealing with multiple clients all across the world, uh, what has that been like in terms of helping clients understand the need to evolve managerially to manage all those different complexities that we're seeing today? Yeah, look, at the end of the day, this comes down to people, right? We could talk about it through the lens of a you know, third party company, which is, which is quite impersonal, but this is, a, this is all about people. Um, and the, there are sort of three lenses I would put on it. The, f the first is, and it's been touched on by colleagues on the panel already, which is um, demonstrating care for one another. All right. So if you think about the narrative that's going on the whole time for people, right? Cost of living crisis, energy crisis, health crisis, you know, it's just one thing after another. That's pretty wearing on individuals. And, and actually just finding the time and space for people to genuinely care about what's going on uh, for them, and, and I think some of the barriers about talking about, you know, health-related matters, well-being issues, some of those have dropped down a little bit. Not for everybody, but just a, a little bit over the course of the last few years, which is helpful because we're going to need to do more of that, not less of it. Um, you're probably seeing the leading edge, aren't you, of of what might happen in ten years' time, yeah. as a consequence of what's happened in the last three that we need to be thinking about as well. Um, from a client perspective, I'd say there's one thing that everybody's gotten used to. Um, and this is healthy as well, right? Which is, if you think about, you know, professional services, you probably have some impressions of us as PwC, or you would look at a business leader and think, well, they'll know the answer. It's okay not to know the answer anymore, mm -hmm. and actually just talk through stuff, because actually what you'll find is that across, and I think this panel is representative of it, I am sure there are solutions in education and resources that work in engineering, that work in hospitality as well. And that, that cross sector, let's talk about the fact that you found an answer to that issue that we haven't found in this sector yet, and we're genuinely working together uh, around that. I think it's quite reassuring to some businesses to have that exactly that approach, to admit that you don't have the answers yeah. to things, because there's a lot of people feeling quite insecure about lots going yeah, I mean, on. If, I mean, if you talk to an economist at the moment who's got the answer, then you know it's going to be wrong, right? So, <laughs> uh, so, so, and the last thing I'd say is, and I, look, I've said this to a number of people privately, and, I, and, and so I'll, I'll be consistent on this. Everything that I've seen of our clients, of our people, of our souls, it, it doesn't matter what type of business you're running. The reality is, that things are happening more intensively, more quickly than they've ever moved before. And I don't see that slowing down, actually. I think it's, if anything, it's going to speed up, Absolutely. right? And we're expected to have a view on everything, um, instantaneously almost, um, even if you haven't got the answer. The one thing that I think is really important within that, and the health crisis has probably helped with this, is, is a real focus on your own personal well-being and health. And, and that of others in the way in the way that I've just described them, you know, clients, colleagues, and then yourself. Um, and so there are senior people I work with that I would say to them, and I have said to them at various times, outside of our organisation and inside, just look after yourself a little bit better, because that one or two percent is going to make a difference to how you perform and how you lead your team and how you develop your business. And we all want the same thing ultimately, which is the people leading the businesses and across these sectors to be successful. And that comes down as has been ably described by each to um, to be at their very best. Not every day, not every hour of every day, but generally in a better place than we might have been five years ago with everything that's coming at us. Do, do you think, Conrad, do you think the hospitality industry's got to get a little bit worse before it starts getting better at the moment? Where are you on the on the general? I think that good operators and good businesses will continue to succeed. So I think that everyone's just got to look at how they run their business and try and run it as, as efficiently and as well as they can from every function of marketing to operations, how they control their bottom line and drive, drive sales. Um, I think good businesses will always do well. 
do, do you see something in you know what many of us have already said here about the sort of together we're stronger kind of attitude at the moment that you know let's share our experiences let's share our problems absolutely pool resources keep the birmingham and pound within birmingham well. support absolutely. local traders do you think there's yeah. a, a sort of yeah, to I mean, to do that that, that's why I restarted the, the networking group that we did. We saw that you know they were happening in London and Manchester and in other cities, but actually hospitality and catering didn't have any forum to get together and talk about problems and talk about best practice. So we get people wanting to come and talk at our events, which is fantastic. It's a free event that anyone can come to, but I think a lot of industries have that. And, and I see it happening in property a lot. You know, they get together and they talk and, and it, I, I was just not seeing it. So hopefully, yeah, I mean, you know, people do come together and, and cooperate and share ideas, but also like you were saying, Matt, you know, across industries, I think just talking to people and hearing someone else's problems and woes is, it's a positive thing and hopefully you can positively affect that own, as well. Yeah. Exactly right. Mm. So yeah, I think, I think I, hopefully it doesn't have to get worse before it gets better, but you know, if, if people are doing everything that they can, I'm hoping that the industry continues to recover and recover as well. From an SME point of view, as you said earlier, that's one of the things that's really helpful from your point of view, isn't it? To find a community that you can talk to and you can share yeah, experiences absolutely. with. Absolutely, I think that um, when, uh, when I first started my journey, I was part of an accelerator group and it was fantastic. It was great. You know, you had a, a like-minded people, community, you could share issues and have a bit of training, support, mentorship. Um, and then suddenly you're off this program and you're on your own again. And that's what I find is really, really lacking. It's got, there's got to be something that can be developed. And there is lots of um, accelerators. There is a lot of business support. But A, people don't know where to go. Secondly, they're only for limited time. And then when, like now where I'm at the stage, we're going, we're going through growth, we're having new opportunities, we're going through investment. I'm like, I've got to find these people. I have to find them myself. Whereas it would be brilliant if there was some kind of support and guidance. So um, I think it doesn't matter what sector you're in, no matter where I go, there's always someone there who can help. There's always someone there who can just be even just like, hey, oh, I'm here to listen, yeah. just, just an ear or you never know who can introduce you to someone, you know, there's always an opportunity like everywhere. And it's just so I would say, yeah, if people can connect more people, it doesn't have to be in the same sector, yeah. you know, it's all about, you know, just more work. It is about working together and Absolutely. finding those opportunities. And business is business. There are always going to be opportunities that yeah. we all identify in our sectors that would be beneficial to other industries only if we have those connections, collaborations, yeah. conversations, and we can all learn from each other. And so generally for each of you uh, over the year 2023, what is your outlook? Uh, what's your mindset? What, how are you approaching the year as a business? For me, I'm just really going for it. We're going through investment. We were like I said, we've got some opportunities. We're going to be launching um, in the US as well. So we could have, we had a we had a choice of either oh gosh, you know, yeah, we were hit we were hit with COVID. We were hit with shipping, resourcing, you name it. We had every we were hit with every issue going. But we could have sat back and then we thought no, we so we've absolutely we're going for it. So for me, it's all about looking at the opportunities, connecting to the right people. And it's all about continuing to believe in the business that we make a difference, we make an impact, we make a difference to children. And it's finding the right community is going to help me get there. Uh, I think for myself, just speaking about the wider industry, I just hope that the, the recovery, you know, continues within hospitality and, and people use the businesses that, that they love. I suppose from, from my business perspective, we're hoping for a good year and to get to a point that we sort of were pre-pandemic, really, we, we had a nice amount of money in the bank for the rainy day. We didn't realise how much it had rained and for how long. <laughs> but um, yeah, hopefully we can get back to that point. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful about this year. Uh, confident we're, we're absolutely going for it as well so for, from our business's perspective um, we supply 26 different countries 10 different sectors um, and that's part of our strength our core strength is that diversity long may that continue so we're driving to uh, continue our sort of break into the Middle East supplying um, male grooming uh, components for, for razors um, in addition to uh, a lot of componentry that's going into EV and automotive, along with our current largest sector, which is construction and plumbing. Growth in all of those three areas, really. And how are we doing it? Completely relaying out the factory to make us more efficient, give us more capacity within the four walls that we've, we've got. And we've just opened a second tool room dedicated for all our new tooling. 
and that's in a training facility that will be doing all of the practical element of an upskilling course for toolmakers as well. So we've got a lot going on, a lot more going on, and we're um, very confident that, that that's the right thing to be doing. Excellent. Well, we started with you, Matt, so we'll finish with you. What's your, get your crystal ball out. What would you like to see happen in 2023? Look, I'm, I'm really optimistic about the future, right, for, uh, and in particular for this part of the world. Right, so in the near term, we've covered loads of challenges that everybody's everybody's wrestling with. But there is a uh, there's a really nice statement and quote that I, I go back to um, at times like this, which is people overestimate the amount of change that will happen in five years, but underestimate the amount of change that will happen in ten. And if you think about the decade ahead for this part of the world, right, we've actually got a much more balanced economy than we've than we've ever had uh, in terms of sectors, and we've got some really interesting growth sectors. Uh, we've got a really young workforce that actually, if we release that potential, would be very high for the region. We've just come off the back of a brilliant 2022, and actually we've made this place, this city, a place that people around the UK and around the world want, want to visit. Want to be, yeah. All right, and we need to see that come back in the summer as well in different ways. Uh, maybe because people make you know fewer overseas travel choices, and but let's see, let's see tourism be a part of what we do here uh, as well, and then and then actually just a bit of a spirit of resilience and confidence because it's easy to get if you I mean if you listen to everything you've read in the in the media every day you'd, you'd probably you'd probably shut up shop but the, the reality that I see is quite different to what you read in the media uh, which is the businesses as we've heard about optimistic opportunity growth right those are the watchwords that business leaders are, are, are looking for same for myself whether I look at that through the PwC uh, part of it which is the success of our clients, the growth of our people. I mean, we, we barely scratched the surface on the skills agenda, but like, you know, what, are, what we're now doing with graduates and apprentices and, and the diversity of what we're recruiting locally is absolutely fantastic, all right? Um, in terms of inward investment to the region, and I'll put this on with a with sort of growth company comment, you know, we built an enormous pipeline of inward investment inquiries through 2022, okay, for this region. It grew by 300% over the course of 2022, right? We have a thousand inbound projects for the region, right? We've got to convert those, right? Because that goes to jobs, it goes to growth, it goes to opportunity, it goes to opportunities for other businesses. And are they across lots of sectors? Lots of sectors, lots mm -hmm. of sectors, because guess what? This part is right in the center of the country. Yes. You can get the talent, you can recruit people, you can develop people, and actually we're gonna be one of the most connected regions in 10 years time. Absolutely. You know, whether you like or loathe HS2, HS2 is only around the corner in the, in the, in, the, in the scope of the history of Birmingham and the Midlands and the UK. So we've got opportunities like that just around the corner as well, which is why then the last dimension is let's think internationally. And it's not, it's not people tend, to th I think, to think about, oh, to be an international business, you've got to be a large business. One of the things that the last few years, more than any period I think has done, is bring small businesses into the international territories really, really quickly. And we've got to think about how we export trade and services from this region as well using all of the talent that we've got across various industries so optimistic you have to be um and um and let's just go for it again as we did in 22. absolutely and what better way to to wrap it up than talking about optimism for the year in spite of all the challenges that we've had in in the years prior it's going to be a great 2023. I don't know if you agree. Well, it is. I mean, you can see here from the optimism and the plans and the, and the determination. I think that's why these panels are important, because you can read what you like into a survey, can't you? But let's hearing it from across different sectors that there are so many positive things happening and so much proactive things going on behind the scenes. That's what this is all about. So thank you, all of you, for coming in. Thank you so much. A happy and prosperous 2023 to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Cheers.